<clears throat> Welcome everyone, and there are several coming in here at the last minute. So really delighted to have you with us in our second season of these virtual roundtables, and I believe this is our second one of our second season, if I'm correct. And this one is a focus on the local church. You'll learn more about that as we go along, but the local church has a vital role and is, in a sense, the vital role in missions and preparing missionaries. So I want to introduce our panelists for today. Our first one is Doug Becker. Morning. Hi, Doug. Hey, Alan. Doug Good morning, and I everyone. Are longtime friends. I believe, Doug, we were ordained the same day. Is that correct? That's true. With Pastor Tipton. Yeah, we go way back on that. And uh, Doug was ordained to a mini uh, missionary ministry for a short term and uh, appreciate is leading now the missions committee at Mount Calvary Baptist Church. So thank you for joining us, Doug. Thank you for the invite. Our second panelist today is Andy Merkel. And again, I don't know, we didn't do this on purpose, but we've chosen some who are very dear friends of ours. Uh, Andy was just a little, little kid when we got to know his parents who are dear friends. But Andy and, and our son work together. They are at Hardingville Bible Church, and Andy has so many hats uh, that I don't wear so many hats. I don't really know how to describe him, except that he has great gifts for administration. He's gifted in music, and they just uh, are really blessed to have him. And we're blessed, Andy, to have you as part of our panelists today, as part of our panel. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. He comes to us from South Jersey, the pretty part of the state, right? That's right. <laughs> and then Marcus Schliffback. I'm not sure that I have the German accent just right, but it, uh, I know Marcus. I have a brother named Marcus and many people around me with that name as well. So Marcus is on our board. He has a uh, a long history with GFA uh, starting in Germany, actually, and he has a real burden to help local churches with uh, keeping up with their missionaries. So he's got a, a website that uh, brings together lots of information, prayer letters, all that kind of thing. And he's coming to us from Troy, Michigan, Troy, yeah. Michigan. That's right. Yeah, yeah, so thank you, great. Marcus, for being a part of our panel. <clears throat> and then our final panelist today is Ben Smith. And once again, we know his parents uh, better than we know Ben, but we know Ben and we know his wife. Uh, she grew up, I, I guess, Clemson. Is that close enough? Yes, sir. That, that general area. <laughs> she grew up around Clemson, and that's where we got to know the family. But now Ben has taken her to the other side of the country out to Wonderful California, right? There's That's lots it. of things still come out of California. Is that right? <laughs> we're hanging on. <laughs> well, we're glad you're out there and that you're a light in that part of the world. And so thank you, Ben, for coming to us a little bit earlier than some of the others, since you're three hours ahead of us here in Greenville. Well, with uh, that introduction, we'll pray and uh, turn it over to our moderator, John Crocker. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for making the local church a, a certain thing. You've said you would build your church, and we know this is not pie in the sky. This is not something that we can't see or feel. This is something we interact with, and we thank you for these men who represent four different churches doing a great job in keeping up with their missionaries and encouraging missionaries, supporting them, praying for them. So guide the conversation now, give us the information we need and stir our hearts once again for meeting the role that you've given each one of us. And we pray it in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, John, back to you. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. Well, it's good to be here again with you. Thanks to everyone for being here. And uh, thanks to our panelists for participating today and for sharing uh, from Scripture and from uh, the experience that the Lord has given you all uh, regarding this topic. And we're really excited to be able to, to hear from the Lord again 
and uh, try to learn and, and know how better we can serve him um, in the places that he has is, he is put us uh, in the harvest field. In the last round table, the title was Commanded, Called, or Both. Um, and we heard from several missionary panelists from scripture and from their own experience um, share uh, about this command that Jesus left for us to make disciples of all the nations. And we uh, learned a couple different things. We heard about a couple different uh, emphases there. Uh, first, about the uh, role that all believers have uh, to have their lives uh, really governed by that command to make disciples of all the nations, that our own, that our lives and decisions and plans really should be governed by the Great Commission. Uh, and then the second emphasis that we saw in that in that last roundtable was really the need that still exists for certain believers uh, to go, uh, to give their lives, to go to a different place um, and make disciples of all nations in uh, in another place. And the nations still desperately need these messengers to take the gospel um, to them for Christ's sake. The harvest is still plenteous. And the laborers are still very few. That was really the emphasis of the last roundtable. Um, and we, we finished by noting that emphasis that the world still needs people to go. Uh, but uh, the reality is that missionaries don't just go. The missionaries are sent. Um, and uh, missionaries are not sent by charitable organizations and parachurch ministries. Mission boards do not send missionaries. Uh, local churches send missionaries, and mission boards serve churches by facilitating uh, their sending and supporting of missionaries. Churches are the senders, um, and so we want to explore uh, today their vital role, the vital role of local churches um, in this Great Commission and sending missionaries and supporting missionaries to take the gospel around the world. So the four panelists today uh, are from churches in the United States, as Dr. Patterson's already shared, uh, churches that are very involved in uh, carrying out this this vital role. Um, so we want to we want to start uh, by asking our panelists, um, how should a local congregation uh, think and feel even about this privilege? Uh, of being senders. Local churches are made up of disciples of Christ. Uh, local churches, specifically in the United States, are in a sending country. Uh, local churches are made up of disciples who don't go, uh, but are still responsible for making disciples of all the nations. Uh, so how should a, a congregation uh, think and feel about this privilege of being senders? And Mr. Becker, I'd like to start with you. Now, what does the scripture say about this? How, how does scripture inform us about how a church should feel about this privilege? Sure. Thank you, John. Well, I think that uh, we should probably start by just reflecting, as you did so well, on what the Lord is doing in this church age. Hmm. He told Peter that he was going to build his church. And this is the church that he gave his life for. He loves the church. And the method that he uses is the Great Commission that you, again, just reflected upon. Uh, he commands each successive generation of his disciples to evangelize, to disciple, to baptize. And so this is the method he's using to build the church. It's what he is interested in in the world. And so how, how should we think or feel about what our Lord is interested in? I think we should be very excited about it. Amen. Very good. Amen. Amen. I'd like to hear from, from all four of the panelists on that same question. So Ben, we'll go to you next. How should a church think and feel about this responsibility and privilege that we have? Okay. Well, I think to just follow up on what Mr. Becker said, if we, if we have an understanding of the Great Commission and the means that God has determined to use to, mm -hmm. to reach people with the gospel and to bring them to faith in Christ, then I think the starting point for a congregation is to see a continuity between the call and ministry of missions and the call and ministry that every believer has in a local church. So mm -hmm. what, you know, like what we're doing here in California and our congregation is not essentially different than what you all are doing in Mexico City. 
different place, different culture, different language, but we're trying to accomplish the same thing. So there's a continuity there. Um, and, and then I think once we realize that, then we're ready to kind of capture the privilege of being used by God to further his gospel ministry in other places mm-hmm. and to, to other people and, and really to be excited about that, mm-hmm. that that's really an incredible thing that uh, we have the opportunity, not just to be used of God where we are, uh, but to participate, to be actively participating mm-hmm. in what God is doing in other places is, is exciting and a, and a great privilege. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Marcus, how about you? We used, would you to have, yeah, we used to have a youth pastor here in our church that coined a phrase that he used to uh, challenge our teenagers. And that phrase was, uh, you need to have a goal that is greater than yourself, a purpose that is greater than yourself. Uh, and uh, I really think that the Great Commission is uh, a part that, that uh, teaches the church, that teaches us to have that purpose that's greater than ourselves, that God has given. Uh, that, that we go out and do it. we all tend to get wrapped up uh, in the daily uh, business of life. We get overwhelmed. Uh, we get short-sighted. Uh, we have temporal purposes, temporal struggles. Uh, and and uh, actually, I, I, I see missions as a, as a part of God giving us that, that greater vision that, that he wants us to be. Part. Amen. Amen. Very good. Very good. Andy, what would you add to that same question? Well, I think the guys have covered it really well. Um, I'll add just one little thing. And I think that is just getting a view of the grandeur of what God is doing around the world. Mm -hmm. Um, If we are taking an active part in global missions, we're actually doing something that's going to last for eternity. Mm -hmm. And it's the greatest thing going on right now. Mm -hmm. We get so captured by the little things that seem to excite us. Mm-hmm. And uh, we can't directly command our feelings often. Mm-hmm. But your question was about how, how should we think and then feel as a result. Yep. And uh, if we can make ourselves mm-hmm. think big thoughts and good thoughts about missions, mm-hmm. I think we put it in its right place. Mm-hmm. Amen. Very good. Very good. That's great. So that, that, those are great answers about how a church should think. And then as Andy pointed out, as a result, I really, really feel about this privilege of being involved in what Christ is doing uh, to build his church around the world. Uh, maybe a follow-up question uh, to that, maybe a natural question. Um, how, how can a local church emphasize this role and help, uh, help its people, help the congregation uh, really uh, think and feel this way? Uh, really rejoice in this privilege that the Lord has given to the local church? How can a local church emphasize this uh, and really keep its people focused in this way uh, on the Great Commission? And and Ben, we'll start with you on this one, please. I think um, like all of our aspirations for what the church should think and be doing, it has to start with teaching. I mean, that's that's really um, the obligation of the leadership of a church is to set this before the congregation and be teaching them. Now, there are probably a lot of ways to do that. I mean, we, you know, we first think of preaching, right? When you think of teaching in the church, and that's right, that's the place we have to start. We have to mine out these truths from scripture for our people and let the spirit use the word. Uh, to mold his people and mold our thinking and our action. Um, So, you know, preaching uh, is the starting point here. But I I do think there are some other ways to keep this in front of of people. I'll just mention one other. I'm sure the other guys will mention other ones. But, you know, even even the songs that we sing or the things that we emphasize in our worship service, those are teaching tools, right? We're, we're teaching and admonishing one another in songs and hymns and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So, um, you know, even throughout the year, we, we incorporate kind of mission themed worship services, even when we don't have missionaries here, you know, it's pretty typical to do that uh, when you're having a conference or something, but we have this great heritage of, uh, of even music and hymns. Um, 
Isaac Watts' famous hymn, Jesus Shall Reign, Where Ere the Sun Doth Its Successive Journey Run. A lot of people don't know Watts wrote that in response to a resurgence of emphasis on the Great Commission. That was the theological foundation for taking the gospel. Hey, is the king over the whole earth? Then he should be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. And I, so I, that's just one small way is, is pointing those things out to our people and, and teaching and learning and conforming our thinking to what God is doing through the gospel. Very good. So teaching in, in a variety of ways uh, keeps this in front of the church. Good. Mr. Becker, what else? Well, I think this reflects back to something Ben said in his initial comments, and that is the connection. Hmm. Uh, and fortunately, we live in a very connected world. So in some ways, it's very easy for us to stay connected to our missionaries. But in order to keep the uh, impression before our people, it's really helpful that, for them to stay connected. Uh, many of our missionaries travel. Now, we're talking a little bit more about the pre-COVID world, but our <laughs> missionaries travel a lot. And so frequently, they're in our services and just giving them an opportunity to share what the Lord is doing in their ministry keeps the congregation excited about it. And then when they aren't there in person, they're very frequently sending out prayer letters and staying up to date on those needs, getting those uh, prayer requests in front of the congregation keeps that connection going. Good, good. And Marcus, there on the, the missions committee, how does your church, what, what, what is important for your church as you try to keep, uh, keep the congregation uh, really thinking correctly about this privilege of being a part of the Great Commission? Live by example, and the mm -hmm. is contagious. Uh, honestly, uh, these roundtables for me, they have been really inspiring, really encouraging, really uh, helping me to uh, share that enthusiasm. And, and honestly, what, what the uh, missionaries have been doing here with us, what you have been doing as you personally are an example to me in that, uh, is that uh, really, you set the example for us, uh, and our students are excited uh, and enthusiastic, enthusiastic about what God is doing, the grander, how Andy called it uh, earlier, of, of God's work. Uh, that will have an impact. Uh, if I think uh, in my life, who had the most impact on, on me? It's normally people that, that just have a love for God, that have an enthusiasm for the gospel, that, mm. that love the word. Uh, and and I think that's our role, that mm. we, we need to be contagious in that. Mm. Wow. Amen. Well, those are great. Those are great answers uh, and very um, uh, filled with really exhortation. I think all of those, um, the answers that have just been shared um, I, to, to really help our congregations uh, think uh, correctly about this privilege that we have. That's that's great. Um, ben, would you share um, maybe a passage of scripture or, or two briefly that connect the local church uh, to this role of of being senders? Uh, what what is where does scripture talk about the local church in this way that that we the local church has this role of sending people out with the gospel? Sure, there are a whole bunch of these, and we could spend a lot of time, you know, looking at all these passages. There's one that when I first ran across it, it, it just has stuck with me, and I, I seem to keep coming back to, and it's kind of in a, an obscure place for us, but it's in 3 John, hmm. and, and John is writing to these believers, and he tells them that he, he commends them for their faithfulness in supporting these people that he calls strangers. He actually says that they're, that they're strangers and that he's commending the believers because they've sent these people out on their journey. And, and John says, you know, you've done well in that to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of the Lord because they've gone out for the sake of his name. I just think that's such a precious passage that that here are people who are going out, right? We're talking about sending, 
They're going out and there are people that are furthering them on their journey, even strangers. And why would they do that? Well, they would do that because those people are going out for the sake of, of the Lord's name. And so I think about that often, you know, when we have missionaries here, that that's our desire that when they leave here, they have a sense, uh, even if they're maybe not officially our supported missionaries, but that they have a sense that we're sending them, you know, on their way and that by their time with us, they're somehow encouraged, supported financially or helped to go forward, taking the name of the Lord. So that's one. I'll mention one more. Um, you know, there are all of these passages where Paul is asking for the believers to pray for him. And, and I tell our folks here often that, you know, really the, the financial support, as important that is, and with missionaries in here, I don't want to suggest that I'm diminishing the financial support side, but in some ways, that's the easy thing. Um, yes, it's a sacrifice, but, you know, writing a check and dropping it in the offering plate mark for missions is really one of the easier parts of supporting missions. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, everything in the Christian life is easier than prayer. Mm. And if, if that's true, if we really think Lloyd-Jones is onto something there, mm. we've got to read these exhortations from Paul to pray have a confidence that nothing of eternal value is going to happen unless it's bathed in prayer, that God uses prayer as a means to accomplish his purpose. And so in some ways, our commitment to travail with our missionaries on our knees before the throne of God in prayer and to do that faithfully, it's a huge way that we send and support missionaries. Amen. So those, those are just kind of two uh, passages that I think of. Very good. That's good. Um, Andy, as we, as we talked through this before you, you shared um, a number of passages from the life and ministry of the apostle Paul and the, the different ministries that different local churches had uh, in his, in his life, in his, in his own ministry. And I'm wondering, would you be able to, to take a, a, maybe a, a couple minutes and tick through those passages that you shared with me um, just to reflect the variety of ministries that a church can have uh, in the life and, and ministry of a missionary based on, on what you shared from the life of the apostle Paul. Absolutely. I really appreciate what Ben just said that um, mm -hmm. the emphasis on local church su support of missions um, is kind of woven throughout the new Testament. Um, so we can't go far without seeing something. So yeah. I'll pick kind of the cream. How about that? Yeah, good. Um, from Acts 13, um, where we see a group of men getting together. And then as they ministered to the Lord, verse 2, and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And so they being full, uh, sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Mm -hmm. So with the Holy Spirit's accompaniment, these men are sent out mm -hmm. by a local church. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, the obvious passage, right? Mm -hmm. They're like literally sent out. <laughs> but what else happens? We see in 2 Timothy 4 verse 13. So Paul says, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. So there's some physical support there. And that's encouraging for all of the uh, physical ways that we try to support missionaries. I think that's a good basis for that. Hmm. Back in Acts 14, verses 26 through 28. And thence they sailed to Antioch. And from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. Mm -hmm. So I see there that when missionaries come home, mm -hmm. there's this immediate connection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just said what I shouldn't have said. They don't come home. Missionaries are at home, we like to say. 
But when they come back to a supporting church, mm-hmm. there's a there's a connection uh, of of real spiritual support. And one last passage I'll mention is Philippians 4, verse 14. Mm-hmm. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Mm-hmm. Anybody that is involved in the church in an active way is going to suffer some sort of opposition, persecution, mm-hmm. affliction, trouble. And we are all in this together. Mm-hmm. We need to emphasize the camaraderie that we have with that. Mm-hmm. Okay, good, good. Now, another question, how, how can we translate all this into 2021? The cultures are different. Um, uh, life is, is different in 2021. The, print, the biblical principles are unchanging. Um, how do we take some of these examples and some of these principles that uh, we've, been, we've been looking at in the scripture and, and translate them into 2021? Um, and into the missionaries who go out in 2021 to share the gospel in other places. How can local churches uh, really uh, support as senders uh, missionaries now? How can we take these principles? I've, I've never, I never left a cloak in Troas, uh, me personally. Um, and I've had people visit us in, here in Mexico City. Nobody's ever brought me any parchments. Um, people have brought me some books, um, but you know there are some differences in in how these things are applied today, right? Uh, so how how can I want to hear from all four of you on this? Uh, there'll probably be a little bit of overlap, and that's fine. But you're all in different ministries, and and I'd like to hear from you your your different perspectives, what you and your ministries do uh, to try to support uh, missionaries that. Uh, that have gone out from your church or that your church uh, participates with in the Great Commission. Marcus, we could start with you. Right. Well, very practically, uh, uh, we live in a a suburban area. Uh, It's a a larger church and uh, a lot of people coming and going and our church Mm -hmm. uh, supports about uh, 70 missionaries. Uh, When you come to the church at first, it's it's daunting to to really get to know everybody and to get Mm -hmm. The, the missionaries and uh, uh, we we strive to f- provide a tool to them to to connect to everybody. Uh, oh, part of that is uh, what Doug said earlier. It's important that we all connect with our missionaries. Uh, missionaries they send regular uh, missionary updates and missionary letters. Uh, and what we have done here at our church, uh, we have set up a website. Uh, that is that is that allows every church member to have access to all missionary letters at all times very easily. Now it's a it's a secure website. Uh, you need a login. Uh, I'm gonna share the uh, the website information uh, in the group chat. But when you go find, uh, you, you you have to have an account first. You have to have a login, uh, and and uh, your church needs to be set up on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, once you have an account. Uh, then it will pull up just the missionaries that your support, your church supports uh, and give access to their missionary letters to those that have an approved account. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with that, then uh, it allows people to stay informed, to stay up to date. Uh, it also allows us to print a little uh, booklet here uh, where we have a print function on the page uh, and uh, we can give this to, to our church members to uh, just get an introduction, get an overview. Uh, and um, this platform is designed really to use by churches around the country. So if anybody here in the audience uh, is, is interested, uh, uh, contact me. I'll also uh, put, a, put an email address in there uh, for our church, uh, and, and we can help you get set up, get your church set up. Uh, and that's, that's part, uh, that's an opportunity, actually, that everybody here in the audience today has to help their own church uh, to set something like that up with actually very little effort, uh, and we can all collaborate churches around the country uh, in that effort uh, that uh, the, church, the the information is up to date uh, and and connect with our missionaries that way and and keep everybody in our churches informed. Now, uh, a second thing we do in our in our churches, we have a program we call Adopt Our Missionaries. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it basically, we encourage people in our church to just pick one missionary families because there are so many, uh, and we all connect with everybody, uh, but pick one 
uh, get really familiar with them, get to know them, pray for them regularly, connect with them, uh, encourage them, uh, and and uh, share with others what's going on in their lives and and uh, about their ministry. Mm. Uh, and those are those are two tools that we have found very very helpful uh, mm. to encourage the people in our church to actually do and use technology uh, to to stay connected, to mm. be informed, uh, and and. Um, Stay up to date what's going on because that's really the, the purpose here. Good. Excellent. Excellent. That's great. Mr. Becker? Well, first of all, Marcus, that was so exciting. Thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you for all the work that you obviously have put into that. Mm. Uh, to jump right on to what you were saying, um, this is especially applies to larger churches like your church and like Mount Calvary. Um, we support over 70 missionary units. And to try to keep up, I'm talking about um, just someone in the in the congregation. To try to keep up with all 70, you just throw your hands up in despair. Um, it's a full-time job reading the prayer letters. So we've tried to come up with practical ways. Like Marcus was just giving us a really good example in that adopt a missionary program. In our church, uh, we pretty much have our adult <clears throat> congregation um, in separate Sunday school classes. We have about six Sunday school classes. And so each year, what we do is we divide up an, uh, the missionaries among the classes, mm -hmm. and we do various things to encourage the classes to stay in contact with those particular missionaries so that that large number is broken down into a, a workable. And uh, various classes do different things. Some of the classes will contact the missionaries on, a, you know, maybe three or four times a year. A couple of years ago, um, my class was connected with John. And it was always exciting to start Sunday school off with a three or four minute video from John, just giving us an update um, of what the Lord was doing right then in his ministry so that we could pray for, for him. And I just want to mention one other thing. And again, it might be sort of um, something that relates more to a church in a city like Greenville, where we have a connection with Bob Jones University, but we have a lot of our missionaries who send their children. Uh, to, mm. here to Greenville for schooling. And so we try to have an outreach of encouragement and showing care for the missionary children uh, who are away from their parents. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Andy, how about there in Hardingville? As the other guys uh, just emphasized, I think communication really is the, the spring from which so many other um, connections happen. Um, mm. We, we do both informal and formal communication with our missionaries. So let me just touch on both of those. We have something I don't know if any other church does, but I inherited this from folks that were here before I began here. And that is an annual missions information form. And um, it covers a number of bases, um, but it does also provide an opportunity for missionaries just to say what's, what's the uh, right now the top needs that they have um, it also helps to ensure that they're on the same page with us. We don't no, nobody likes surprises. Um, so uh, we, we like to ensure that our missionaries are you know, operating in the general sphere that we would. Um, and then uh, I try to communicate based on that. Um, the other side of things is, the, you know, the informal, you know, how, how are things going and connecting by virtual meetings like this one with missionaries one on one has been helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, I think also just regular uh, quick responses to missionary letters. And I think there needs to be one person um, or in a, a larger palette of missionaries for a larger church, maybe a few designated people that know what to do with information that they pick up on missionary letters. Hmm. And uh, so somebody that can take a little hint that a missionary might drop of some financial need or some project going on and knows immediately what to do with that so that... Um, the people that um, can send funds from the church are are mobilized right away. Um, those are the two things I'd say. Good. That's great. That's great. Ben, how about you? I'm, I'm getting encouraged and getting ideas already <laughs> listening uh, to uh, the other men. I, obviously, communication is a huge deal. And, and in that way, we're actually blessed. Um, by the time that we live in, we should recognize, you know, as much as we can bemoan social media and the ills of, of all that comes with that, there are some really good things. I was talking not too long ago with the Thrill Falls and uh, 
Mrs. Threlfall remembers as a child, as a missionary kid, mm. that their connection with their churches was airmail letters. Took weeks to get, you know, a, a letter back. I mean, think about that, really, trying to set up uh, 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 furlough information with churches and you're relying on, you know, letters going back and forth. So we're blessed through social media, WhatsApp, you know, I, I Facebook Messenger back and forth with our missionaries on a regular basis. I, I do think a key component is that communication is two way. Mm. And I have to say, this is something that I've tried to do and I haven't been super successful in, but I do think it's important not just to receive information from the missionaries, but communicating back to missionaries. And it's funny that, uh, you know, most churches get a little grumpy if they don't hear from their missionaries on a regular basis, but we don't do a very good job of, mm -hmm. of returning the flow of information. And so it's good to be informing the missionaries about what the Lord is doing uh, in the, in the congregation. Other thing I would say about giving, um, and there are a lot of different ways to set up, you know, a missionary support system in a church, but however, a church does that. I think trying to communicate to folks a connection between what they give and the support that it provides to a missionary. So at our church, we've done that. There are pros and cons to this, but we've always had a, a mission support system where what comes in designated for missions is equally divided and goes out. And our church just knows if they don't give designated for missions, it doesn't, it doesn't go out. Um, and again, I know that's not for every church situation, but something like Andy's talking about where there are specific needs. And so there's an opportunity to give directly to a need. I, I think those are so important so that it's just not a mechanical thing of, well, I give money to the church. And I guess somehow some of that on a regular basis makes it to the missionaries that our folks, you know, make the connection between their support um, I'll, I'll make one last one last point. I think um, something for us to think about and emphasize more are actually pastoral visits to the field. And this is something that in the space of about a year and a half, three um, men that I highly respect brought this up. One of them was Dr. Patterson, who was with us, and, uh, and another was Eric Mossman, uh, and the third was Gary Reamers. Uh, just emphasizing the significance of that. And so our church took that seriously and established a little fund. Um, Eric, Eric Mossman did the whole financial. So he said, if you, if you even did $50 a month, you know, you put that in a fund, you could be visiting a missionary, you know, every few years. Um, and so I was able to, to take a trip to the field. That is really invaluable. And, and the context and the information that that enables a pastor to bring back to the church and to have a real mm. understanding of what the Lord is doing there and then be a resource to missionaries. So I'll just take this opportunity to give a plug mm. uh, for churches to think about regularly sending um, pastors, elders, deacons to the field to connect with missionaries. There, there are more, but those are a few. Good, good. That's great. Ben, you used the word mechanical. And I, I, I want to kind of pick up on something you just you were saying um, just just before um, about how, um, you know, this probably does tend to become sort of routine, um, particularly in churches that have longevity um, is the kind of thing where, as you mentioned, you know, you, you put your check in the offering. Um, and this is just something that happens. Um, and I, I'm wondering if if you could, if, if some of you or all of you could just maybe just give a couple of bullet points, just really quick answers. How how do you keep this from becoming that just tradition, just routine? Um, how can we keep in front of people? This is participation in what Christ is doing in the world. Yeah. Um, what what would you say to that, Marcus? What what would you say? How how would you how do we keep in front of people? This is actually fulfilling the Great Commission. It's not just paying a bill. Right? Yeah, I, I actually want to pick up on something that Ben said, and, and that is uh, we have so much social media. We have uh, 
much connectivity today. We have such an incredible information overload that uh, that mm. the challenge that we're facing. Uh, and and uh, we, I actually found for me personally, that's a really helpful tool uh, that I have. Mm. Like, you know, pulling out of my phone uh, a Facebook page, I can actually pull up our our missionary letters, and I I can do them. Uh, and and what you said, you have that many missionaries, and you have that mm. coming in. I have actually found that when you get in a habit of staying up to date, it's actually not all that difficult, and mm. it's great if you have the tool to do so. Mm. Uh, that that's what you want to put in people's hands the tool that that they can take our our website and and uh, look at who just send the latest letters and go through them mm -hmm. they read the latest letters and come to the one they haven't read yet they know mm -hmm. date uh and and uh, with 70 missionaries it comes for us it's comes one to two a day that's not all that hard if you do that uh, on a daily basis uh and and uh, the, the that's a way for us to to stay in front of them and and to uh, uh, counter that 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 information overload that we yeah good for something alternatively good good and Ben you already said a little bit about this but would you add anything else how, how do you how do you keep this fresh yeah I I think one of the things with prayer is actually and and this applies to a lot of areas of prayer but just to encourage our folks that you know there are some prayer requests that God intends us to pray from now until we die, <laughs> you know, and I think sometimes, you know, we can think, man, I'm praying the same thing. Oh, well, well, yeah. I mean, every day from now till we die, God intends us to pray that we would grow in grace, right? God intends us to pray that the gospel would go forward. So we, we need to have something of a comfort with a, with a pattern of prayer where there are repeated, persistent, prayer requests. I, I think another way to keep it fresh is um, to give the congregation opportunities to hear from the missionaries themselves about the impact of support from, from your church or from another church so that connection is made. I think, too, emphasizing the role that believers in the past have had in, in missions work. I'll just give one example. Almost everybody that knows about missions knows about William Carey, but William Carey was supported um, in his pioneer efforts by a, a group of friends back home who were pastors, and, and one of the best known among those was Andrew Fuller. But, you know, those kinds of stories, or, you know, R.G. Letourneau, who gave financially um, the founders of Banner of Truth Trust you know, we're laymen that, you know, just to keep before our folks these stories from the past of how the Lord has been pleased to use and mobilize churches to, to speed forward the gospel in other places, I think helps keep that an exciting and fresh kind of thing. Good, good, good. Mr. Becker or Andy, either one of you want to add anything to those, to what Ben and Marcus I'll, shared? I'll I'll jump right in because it goes right along with what Ben was just sharing. And that was, again, we keep talking about connection and that's such a vital part of all of this. Um, we all like to hear success stories mm -hmm. and uh, everything on the mission field is by no means a what we would uh, classify as a success story. But when we hear about what the Lord is using our supported missionaries to accomplish for his glory, that is really exciting. And um, I'll be very vague here, but one of the missionaries that's on our call right, right now, right this moment, shared with us uh, really the ordeals that one of his converts has been going through. Mm. And I think that really motivated our, our yeah. church and showed us that this is real. This is another yeah. human being that God has saved. And look what he's going through for Christ's sake. And it motivates us to pray because we hear about a real life brother in Christ good. through one of our missionaries and what the Lord's using him to do. Good. Good. That's great. That's great. I would well, just add this. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah. Uh, I'll be real quick. Yeah. yeah. That's fine. We get mechanical in so many different parts of the Christian life mm. and what as Christian leaders in churches, we've got to make sure our own hearts are mm. warm towards missions yeah. and then we can really pray for others in our churches. That's great. And the Lord can do that work to make hearts come alive again for what he's doing around the world. Amen. That's great. Amen. Very good. Very good. Well, we're going to shift gears just a little for the last 15 minutes or so. Um, we've been talking up until now about supporting those who have already gone. Uh, that really has been the emphasis so far. 
Um, but um, we're aware, right, that the missionary force is dwindling very, very rapidly. Um, and very, very few, relatively speaking, uh, are stepping forward um, to, to fill the ranks. So we want to shift gears a little bit. If we're thinking about this topic, the local church, the vital role of senders, uh, we also need to talk about the, the role that local churches have uh, to be developing uh, and seeking to send new missionaries. Um, this is a little, a little shift in gears, right? We've been talking about supporting those who have gone. Uh, but, but now, how can a local church stir its people uh, toward missionary service? Um, and, and Andy, um, you've recently written uh, a, an article, a blog post, uh, that talks some about this. Would you just maybe share a little bit from that, uh, from that article? Um, how, what can a local church do to stir its people toward missionary service? Take, take about a minute, if you could, and just and list some of those things that a local church can be doing. I'm grateful for the chance to write an article and the invitation to do that. Um, I'm just going to take the content of that article and chew it up and spit it out in a different form real quick. All right. So um, what, what happens, I think, is that we need to exhort people from the pulpit. Mm. We need to be able to exhort individuals in one-on-one -on -one conversations. Mm. Those are really direct means yep. of sending people. Yeah. Indirectly, we need to keep the facts of the gospel right in front of our people. Mm. So that's part of the warp and woof of how we breathe as Christians. And then we also need to emphasize how New Testament churches get built for the glory of God mm. forever. And that it's not a whole bunch of programs like a lot of American churches have, but those have contributing ways um, to what mm -hmm. the Lord is doing around the world. But making disciples of individuals, mm -hmm. that's what churches are called to do. Amen. Amen. Very good. Very good. Ben, what would you add to that? Well, I think uh, there, there's been, um, along with this trend, you called it a, you know, a dwindling of those who are going, I I've seen another trend and, and I'm not going to say that this is the cause. Mm. Uh, I think there are probably a lot of causes for where we find ourselves. Some of this is the overall health or lack thereof, mm. uh, of the Christian church in America. Mm. Um, but, but maybe a trend that's been a little bit of a contributing factor, if I can be so bold as to say that, but when I was in, in college and in seminary, there was um, a, a, a discomfort with how in the past, pastors and preachers had exhorted young people to full-time vocational Christian ministry. Mm. And I think in my generation and maybe the generation just before me, there was a sense that strongly exhorting and calling and having invitations at the end of sermons, um, that doing that and calling young people strongly to full-time vocational ministry, uh, there was a sense among my generation that that unintentionally communicated um, kind of a divide between secular callings and sacred callings. Mm. And so I think, again, in, in my generation, there's been a backlash against that and, and, a, and a right recapturing that every calling, every life calling from God is sacred. And that is, that's true. Mm. But as so often is the case, the pendulum can swing too far the other direction, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, and again, I, I've just noticed this, even in my own, my own part, you know, I'm slow to really exhort young people to consider um, but I think that's a weakness of our generation, yeah. that there is a place, as Andy said, to exhort <clears throat> young people. Don't we believe that God is pleased to call some of these young people mm. to yeah. full-time vocational service? Isn't that a high calling? That doesn't, that doesn't diminish mm -hmm. anyone else's life for Christ, but but don't we believe that God is still doing this? Amen. Well, if he's still doing it, then one of the, the obligations of those who stand before God's people is to challenge them 
And so I, that's a long way of saying, I, I think we have to recapture a balance here um, in, in church ministry of, of calling young people to consider whether the Lord would be pleased to have them pursue uh, a vocational full-time um, gospel ministry and to do that honestly, unapologetically, Amen. Um, I, I think is, is a part of what we're seeing take place today. Fantastic. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. So we're talking about a local church stirring its people toward missionary service. I want to add one thing and then we'll, and then we'll jump to a, a couple of final questions. Um, I, I think, I think we need to work as local churches um, to create a culture of praying for laborers. Um, this is the explicit command of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out workers into his harvest. Um, and local churches need to take seriously that command and develop that kind of culture of praying for laborers. And I think what we, we see is a congregation walks together with Christ um, specifically to pray in the way he himself commanded. Um, spiritually minded people will be constantly stirred. <laughs> um, mm. I think that's the wisdom of Christ in telling us to pray for laborers, that one of the results is that it stirs us. Um, and um, the compassion of Christ that preceded that command as he looked upon the multitudes, uh, that heart of Christ for the nations will actually become the heart of that local church. Um, so I think there ought to be a, a regular, even constant emphasis on this command of Christ to pray for laborers that goes beyond uh, praying for physical needs. It goes beyond praying for the spiritual growth of, and the salvation of people locally. It even goes beyond praying for missionaries that are already on the field. All those things are good and necessary. I'm talking about the plentiful harvest and a relentless emphasis on the need for laborers. Uh, and pleading with the Lord as local churches to send out new workers. Um, I, I think we need, we need to have a culture like that in our local churches of praying for new laborers. Um, and that is actually one way that the Lord will use to stir uh, our congregations uh, and stir individuals regarding missionary service. Now, how can a church prepare future missionaries? Uh, both spiritually and practically. We're talking about new workers. Uh, so again, each of you, maybe just give a couple of bullet points here about how local churches can help uh, people in their churches be prepared for missionary service. Marcus, we'll start with you here. Uh, one very practical one that I want to throw out. We are here uh, in our church involved in young single adult ministry and uh, mm. uh, take uh, short-term mission trips and really the primary uh, benefit I see in those short-term trips is showing our young people the field, uh, showing them the passion and mission that the missionaries have, uh, and getting inspired by that uh, and see if God wants to call them there. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Ben? I think part of it is just recognizing that, um, that young people you know, it's not like they go to college and get a missions degree and that makes them a missionary <laughs> or they sign up with a mission board and that makes them a, or you get a ticket and you fly to another country and that flips a switch and turns somebody into a missionary. We need to be cultivating in our churches this passion for Great Commission work and equipping young people mm. to, to be be missionaries, mm. you know, the little Sunday school song, be a missionary every day. But to be missionaries right now mm. and, and in our churches. And then I don't think it's so far of a leap mm. to, to go to the field and do over there what's already been the practice to do here. So I, I think that's an important understanding. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Mr. Becker. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to add more to those excellent comments, but jumping back to what Marcus was saying, I think encouraging our young people to visit missionaries, even uh, from the high school age, our young people regularly take uh, trips to the mission to some kind of it is not necessarily a foreign mission field, but to a church plant to help out. And then when they do volunteer to go to have the finances ready to get behind them, 
make it a pop help them make it a possibility is I think a real encouragement to them. Good. Good. Andy, what would you add? Well, tomorrow's missionaries are growing up today and they're in homes Amen. and humanly speaking, um, uh, a missionary, a budding missionary has a greater chance of making it to the field if his home environment is mm. encouraging that. So mm. I think indirectly we can help our parents wow. in our churches to, uh, to shepherd their children in a way that wow. really encourages them to go to the field. I think it's almost the opposite in so many homes. Mm. My parents are saying, um, you do whatever you want. Just don't go to the mission field. We want you nearby home. Mm. And that's awful. Yeah. Um, we ought to be encouraging our parents to say, look, send your, send your little arrows out as far as they can go um, and spread them around the world. Be ready to say goodbye. You're going to be in eternity in heaven for eternity um, with them. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really important yeah. emphasis that pastors yeah. and others can give to the parents yeah. in the church. Oh, very good. Good. Gracious. Andy, that was great. Thank you. Good. All of you. Um, and um, one final question, and then we'll close with each of you giving us a, just a, a brief exhortation. Uh, what, you know, what part do local churches have in actually identifying in, in their ministries those whom God has called or might be calling? Um, we often don't think about, think about it this way. You know, often we think about people offering themselves for missionary service, and that's wonderful. Um, but do local churches actually have a responsibility at times to say, hey, you, <laughs> you might, you, you might want to consider actually being a missionary. Okay. What, what part do, do local churches have in actually identifying and calling out uh, people that God might be calling? Uh, ben, we'll start with you. Well, I, I think based on the passages that Andy shared from the scripture that actually biblically, this is the role of the church. Yeah. Um, is identifying and commissioning and sending out gospel workers. Personally, this was my experience toward pastoral ministry in my church was that um, through the input of my pastor and encouragement to use particular gifts in ministry, you start investing yourself in a particular direction and your heart follows with that. So I think that is key to identify young people who have spiritual sensitivity and cultivate their ministry gifts and put opportunities before them. And I will say another kind of cultural trend as, as young people in churches um, attend, go away and attend Bible colleges less and less. This is a trend. Young people are staying home. They're attending community college. You know, it used to be that the pickings were ripe. You just had to go to, you know, to a Bible college and that's where the Christian young people were. Well, that's really decentralized now. And so there is a, a need for churches to be identifying young people that maybe have no plans to, to go away from home and equipping them and, and, and sending them out in gospel ministry. Amen. Amen. Excellent. Mr. Becker? The passages that the brothers have shared are all really helpful, but especially to me, Acts 13 was very formative. Mm. And so I'll just throw my little admonition here for those of you who are on the call uh, that are contemplating serving the Lord on the mission field. Uh, you really need to get involved in a local church. Mm -hmm. You need to throw your life into the ministry of that mm -hmm. church. Uh, you do not want to be a maverick. You do not want to go to the mission field having jumped from church to church to church. Mm -hmm. You want your home church to be excited to send you. And so that's my little admonition is uh, find the church that the Lord wants you to be part of. And if he wants you to go, then it's going to become very clear to the leaders of that church, just like it did in Paul and Barnabas's case in Acts 13. Excellent. Very good. Andy, how can churches identify missionaries? I'm not sure I can add anything to what the other guys said. <laughs> Keep your eyes open, look yeah. for them, encourage them, uh, vet them well, yeah. and uh, send them out. Yeah, good. How about maybe maybe a question for all of you just quickly. Um, as, as we see people in churches that are, that are serving, they're involved, 
uh, is there a particular character quality or, or maybe two that you would just name uh, without really explanation? Again, just these bullet, what kind of character qualities uh, really stand out as churches are watching people in their ministries thinking that person ought to go to the mission field? Anything in particular come to mind? Just the kind of character quality that you're looking for. A sanctified work ethic. Mm. Somebody who's Sorry. faithful. Good. Without a lot of oversight. Good. I think is important. Okay. Good. A love for the Lord and a love for the word. <laughs> Amen. Very good. Excellent. Say joy, mm. contentment, good. faithfulness, persistence, self-control. Very good. Wow, that's great. Mr. Becker, anything to add? No, they took them all from me. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Good. Well, that's great. Those are, those are convicting and, and very um, uh, challenging traits. All right. Final question for each one of you. Okay. Um, as we're thinking about local churches and this role of senders, both supporting people who have already gone and then seeking to send out new missionaries. Um, you know, as I'm a member of a local church, why, why should I really feel the weight of this? You know, why should this really matter to me? Um, this issue of a local church as a sending institution. I'd like for all of you to answer that, uh, please. Marcus, we'll start with you on this one. Because life has a purpose that is greater than ourselves. Mm, amen. Uh, there is an eternal perspective that we have in our daily walk, uh, and uh, missions is part of that. Yeah, very good. Excellent. Excellent. Mr. Becker? Uh, I'll just swing right around to what I started with. What mm. does Jesus care about? Amen. And if he cares about it, I need to care about it. Mm -hmm. Very Amen. good. Amen. Excellent. Excellent. Andy? In two passages of Revelation are really forefront of my mind from revelation 7 verses 9 through 10 mm -hmm. after this i beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our god which sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb mm -hmm. that crowd is going to be impacted by what mm -hmm. we're doing around the world amen and then hmm. the converse later on in hmm. revelation is really sobering mm -hmm. there's a great white throne in revelation 20 verse 11 and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them hmm. it's the unsaved hmm. and i saw the dead small and great stand before god and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Mm. There may be some people there that mm. we could have reached. Mm. That's sobering. Mm. Yeah, very good. Mm. Ben? I mean, in light of what Andy just read, I mean, what is as significant as that? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, this is what God is doing in the world. And we need to get on board with his plan and not, not try to mold him to our plan. Uh, it's like Marcus said, there's a, there's a purpose greater than ourselves. Um, God is calling people out of every nation, out of every language, out of every people group to gather around his throne for all of eternity as trophies displaying the majesty of his grace in Christ. Mm. I mean, what, what could be a more significant life investment mm. than to give ourselves to the mission that God is pursuing mm. in the world today? Amen. Mm. Amen. Very good. Very good. It's a good way to wrap up with those four uh, really, really sobering and challenging exhortations. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Becker, uh, to Andy, Ben, Marcus. Thank you all for your investment of time and effort uh, to serve us so well today. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to pray, and that'll finish the uh, the, the hour-long uh, session. 
Uh, but we'll be sticking around for another 25 minutes or so for a time of questions and answers. Um, if any of you has a question you'd like to share or have these panelists address today, uh, you can put that in the Zoom chat or you can, uh, after I pray, you can ask that verbally if you'd like to do that, that's fine as well. Just, um, just begin talking um, and uh, ask your question or you can use the zoom chat and send that to me or even post it post it publicly so that we can see it and and have the panelists address your questions um, if we at gfa can serve you in any way uh, please let us know um, i finish all we end all these round tables uh, remembering that the lord is currently fulfilling his promise to build his church that is what is going on in the world today as we just uh, shared um, and if the Lord is working in your heart and you're wondering what role you might play uh, in what the Lord is doing uh, to build his church, if there's something GFA can do to help you or serve you in any way, we would consider that a privilege. So you can reply to the email that you received with the Zoom link uh, that would go to Dr. Patterson and um, we could uh, really uh, seek to serve you in the name of Christ. Uh, so I'm going to pray. If you need to leave after I pray, that's that's fine. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I trust it was an encouragement and help to you. Uh, but for those of you who'd like to stick around and have a little more time for interaction and questions and answers, we'll be doing that for a few minutes um, after I pray. One more thing. Uh, next uh, next roundtable is November 13th. Uh, you can put that on your calendars. The title is From Interest to Burden to Field. Uh, from interest to burden to field. And we're going to hear from five panelists who were at kind of different stages um, in their um, uh, ministry of the Great Commission. Uh, a couple that are on a short term, a couple that are preparing to go to the field um, on deputation now, uh, and one career missionary already on the field. And they're going to tell from their own perspectives uh, how God directed them um, to a burden for missions and then an, uh, to an interest and then a burden uh, and in the case of some of them uh, back to the mission field permanently we understand that not every believer uh, will end up on the field permanently uh, but God does desire that all of us be looking forward and taking the next step trusting in him to guide and we're going to hear from five different panelists about their own their own testimonies of the Lord's work and direction in their in their lives so let's pray together um, uh, and give thanks to the Lord for the time we've had. Father, thank you for uh, this time and for um, really fixing our eyes again on this purpose that is so much bigger than ourselves. Um, Lord, would you stir us, stir us um, to carry out the role that you have given to each one uh, in the harvest. Lord, it's uh, every role is unique. Every person is unique. But Lord, we do long to be used uh, wherever you've placed us, doing whatever you've given us to do. So Lord, would you stir us and direct us that we might uh, use our lives for the sake of Christ and his dear, dear cause. Thank you for these men who have given of their time today to share with us so well, um, so effectively, and so uh, encouragingly and convictingly. Lord, bless them. Thank you for what you've given us today. Uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Very good. Well, if you do need to go, uh, thank you. Uh, have a good day. I look forward to seeing you on November 13th, Lord willing. And we do ask that you would uh, consider sharing this with your own contacts um, so that others might benefit from what the Lord gives us uh, in these in these roundtables. Do hope to see you next time. Um, so we're going to have a, a time here to interact some more uh, with some questions and answers about this uh, specific role. Um, I think one thing that uh, was was maybe absent um, from the discussion today is the role that good. Uh, this was this was mentioned briefly, but. Uh, the, the role that good books and particularly biographies uh, can have in the life of a local church that wants to carry out this vital role uh, of senders. 
anybody want to talk about that? I know that uh, I know you men uh, read books. Um, I'm uh, two of the churches represented are supporting churches. One of the churches represented is actually our sending church. Um, and I, I know that um, you men read good, good biographies. Uh, and if you want to comment on the role uh, that that literature, specifically biographies, have in developing this kind of culture as senders uh, of missionaries. Anybody want to take that? Or well, all of I, you? I, I'll just say, historically, I know that um, uh, there have been generations of missionaries that have highlighted the role of the, the life and journal of David Brainerd was instrumental in an entire group of missionaries going to the mission field and later uh, the story of um, uh, written by Elizabeth Elliot about the missionaries who were martyred in Ecuador mm -hmm. an entire crop so we've seen it happen actually in the history of the church um, I think I think Christian biography does have a huge uh, influence on young people you just think about what you're setting before young people to aspire toward who who are their heroes as they're developing their values so we've done a couple of different things um, of our church we've had uh, summer reading clubs uh, for young people with certificates and prizes we figured pizza hut can give out pizzas for kids to be reading you know the the Church of Christ can encourage good reading. So we've done uh, we've done that before. Um, we've we've actually done Sunday school classes based around telling the stories of faithful believers and missionaries in the past. We've we've had young people. We actually um, on October thirty first. That's Reformation Sunday. We make that here a Church History Sunday, hmm. and that's not always missions focused, but we. Um, actually, two years ago, we did the, um, the 19th century missions movement. We had our young people learn about missionaries and then present their stories to the congregation. So just any number of things like that to expose our young people to good missions biographies mm -hmm. and uh, aspire to these faithful saints of the past. Very good. Good. Anything else to add to that regarding a culture of reading and specifically biographies, missions biographies. Ben, that was helpful. Anything else to add? Any the other men that have seen this in your own churches or um, how you foster this kind of use of biographies to help? Okay. I can speak for myself. Yeah, um, good. That it just, it makes it so much more real when you're reading somebody's thoughts. Sometimes it's even more real than talking with or reading with reading a missionary's prayer letters today, mm -hmm. because you're you could be reading somebody's private journals, mm -hmm. and you're seeing inside their heart. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I think of Henry Martin as being very influential on my life, um, and he went to the field because he read David Brainerd, mm -hmm. um, and he was influenced by Charles Simeon, not a missionary but a pastor. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of that um, real uh, inner being heart kind of uh influence is really helpful good good i love to read missionary biographies so if you haven't uh discovered that wonderful blessing i would really encourage you and uh many many of the missionary biographies i have read i heard about from my pastor from dr mark minnick and so i i'm sure that ben and andy do this regularly but i think that's an important thing uh, bringing that knowledge of good missionary material, good Christians of the past, uh, quoting from them, mentioning a book that's, you know, telling about their story. Uh, that's, that's a good way to get it out there for the congregation. Good, good. Excellent. Anything else there? Hey, John, can I say something? Please do. Um, one of the things that can be done is to start at a very young age. Mm. We're talking about reading, you know, maybe for ourselves or for our congregation, but there are a number of good short biographies of these famous people. Mm. My wife is reading a biography about Amy Carmichael to our seven-year-old granddaughter. 
Hmm. Um, who's there in Andy's church. And she gets so wrapped up in this book about Amy Carmichael. She also read Mary Schlesser to her. So just a thought about if you want to encourage it in your church, maybe have the parents read some of these books and family devotions or something, yeah, some of these uh, shorter books even. Hmm. Very good. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. And if you need some recommendations, We've I think there's a list. list. <laughs> I think there's a list out there, isn't there, Dr. Patterson? There's a list. All and right. It can get as long as you want it. <laughs> and Dr. Patterson, 1,500 sure. biographies in our Dreisbach library. Okay. So, how many? 1,500. All right. 1,500 biographies. Um, and Dr. Patterson, I'm sure, would be willing to share a, a briefer list, not with 1,500. <laughs> and we but, have a list of 12 as well. Okay, yeah. And I'm sure, Dr. <laughs> Patterson, I'm sure, would be willing to share that with anybody that, that would be interested in having that list so you could get in touch with him. Very good. Thank you for those good, good recommendations on reading. Question that came in, um, this is really, this is good. This is very helpful for young or, or not as young uh, people who are interested in missions but have no plans to go away to Bible college. This was uh, mentioned, I think Ben mentioned this. Um, what essential skills can the local church help instill in them and provide a context for them uh, to practice uh, in that church as a way of developing uh, missionaries within the local church? Uh, really a, a way for local churches to uh, to be very practical in realizing here's somebody that is never going to go away to a formal training institution and get a diploma uh, from a place. What, 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 how can local churches very practically develop skills and give people opportunities to exercise those skills to be, be prepared to go to a foreign field? Anybody want to take that? Well, we have a situation our church right now, um, a young man came to us by way of the Air Force. We're about 15 minutes from an Air Force base here and was saved late in high school and is now a little older because of time in the military and senses the calling of the Lord for some kind of full-time vocational, possibly missions work. So, so we're working through that right now. And, you know, he's a young man. So, as far as skills, uh, we're, I, I meet with him weekly and we go over Bible study skills. He's preached in our church a couple of times and then receives feedback from the elders here. Um, we recently actually sent him out to do pulpit supply for a church in our area that had asked uh, wow. for some help. And that was good experience for him with another congregation. We are trying to supplement some of that with some online Bible study courses which I think is helpful. I mean, there are things that are hard to get outside of, a, of an educational setting, but there are a lot of options for that. So the other things that he's doing, sharing the gospel, evangelism, outreach, I mean, have him do everything. Mm -hmm. You know, teach little kids in Sunday school and junior church, you know, help with a mission, mission an out, you know, an evangelistic outreach. Um, have them in the cleaning rotation, you know, I mean, just fully involved in the life of the church and supplement that as much as possible with the kind of education. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you can get pretty well prepared um, for service to the Lord. So that's, we're currently right in the middle of that process and seeking the Lord's will uh, for what the pathway forward would be for this young man. Good. That's great. Great. Anybody else want to add to that? Uh, Mr. Becker or Marcus or Andy, um, how can how can a church really help develop people that may never get a formal education, a theological education? Well, one of the essentials I feel is that somebody be really good at interpersonal relationships. Because mm -hmm. um, if we're going to be engaging in Great Commission work, that, that means we're going to be talking with people about the gospel and it may be years in the making. Mm -hmm. So if we're good at talking with people and then developing the skills of understanding and explaining, articulating the facts of the gospel, mm -hmm. I think it goes a long way towards being ready just to do whatever God's called you. Obviously, everybody's got different gifts, too. 
So um, sensing somebody's natural gifts and developing those is pretty important. Mm -hmm. Good. That's great. That's great. I'll add something there. I think this this um, is going to require a, a willingness on part of people in the local church and leaders in the local church to really invest time and effort um, in um, in helping people develop these skills. Um, the, uh, a fellow in our, our church here in, in Mexico City, um, I, I spoke with him on Sunday and uh, I asked him if he would be willing uh, if I assigned him a few passages that he would later preach in our church. Um, and he was really, really excited about the possibility. And I'm, I'm excited that he accepted it, right? But you know what that means for me? Um, that, that I'm going to be revising or helping revise uh, sermons that I'm not going to preach, right? While I'm preparing sermons that I am going to preach. Um, but, you know, that's part of developing leadership, uh, that will either stay in, in our case, Lord willing, that will stay in the church or in the case of a church sending out missionaries that will actually go out um, and, and take the gospel somewhere else. So I think it, there is there's going to require a, a time investment, uh, an investment of our own effort to help people uh, grow in some of these skills. Very good. Um, another question that came in, um, a question about um, if I understand this correctly, would not all ages be called and sent? Um, I'm curious. I think that's a really good question. And we've alluded, uh, we've alluded to this a little bit um, with children, how we're developing children um, and our families. But maybe you could address as well um, this idea of, you know, not just young people, college aged people, uh, but adults. Uh, in our churches that are maybe in the middle of a career um, or children, how, how you know, what, can one of you maybe address that? How can we get away uh, from maybe what in the past has been almost, almost an exclusive focus uh, on college age uh, people that are going to go to the mission field um, and really emphasize this, this issue of people of all ages uh, God calls people that are mid-career. God lays a burden on the heart of eight-year-olds that actually never goes away. <laughs> um, what can we do to really uh, broaden our, our emphasis uh, and really try to appeal to other age categories? Anybody want to take that? That's, a, I think, an important question. Anybody want to address that? Probably a part of it has to do with just applying some of the things we've already said, but in a in an age specific way. Ben, I'll give two examples actually. So um, at the day school of where the Throw Falls minister in South Korea, there's a man who's a history teacher in the high school there. He's retired from the Air Force, and uh, you know, you enlist in the military at 18, you do a 20 year career, you're retiring at 38. Mm -hmm. And you have full medical benefits and a pension for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you going to do with what are you going to do with your life mm -hmm. after retirement? I mean, there are folks coming out of the military that are just perfectly positioned. They've been around the world. They've traveled internationally. They've interacted with other cultures. This is a burden for me, again, because we're in a military town. But boy, there's an untapped resource there to see God call folks that have retired from, or maybe another career path like that. Um, another family I think of GFA missionaries, Mark and Carol Mavar. You know, Mark was pursuing a successful career in firefighting. They had a young family. Um, and, and that was a great example of their church, Grace Church of Mentor, using a, a Bible college there at the church. To, to mentor Mark into ministry and GFA picking them up, you know, kind of an out of the box situation and GFA having the wisdom of not requiring, well, you went to this school or you, you know, followed this educational route. And here they've had a fruitful 20 year ministry on the field in Panama City. So I think those are just a couple of ways that absolutely the Lord would be pleased. And think about that people, you know, they joke, Pastor Blanton here at our church jokes that 80s, the new 70 and 70s, the new 60, you know, people are healthier. They're living longer than they have before. 
those are fruitful years. I mean, we, we should not give in to this mentality of kind of fading off into the sunset uh, in your retirement years. Amen. Very good. Good. That's great. That's great. Anything else to add briefly on that? Another question's come in I want to get to. Anything to add on that? Okay, good. Uh, here's a question directed uh, to Marcus. Uh, with so many missionaries these days asking that their letters not be posted online, um, does the website that you've helped develop include these kinds of letters? Um, and if not, how does your church connect church members with those kinds of restricted access letters? Marcus, you want to I talk a little bit about how that how the website handles that. This is really good. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes, we, we try to be very sensitive, number one, to really what uh, the missionaries uh, like, uh, what would allow or what would be uh, comfortable with having on a secure website like that. Uh, and we, we really have varying degrees of, of information that we allow uh, that we put on there and, and normally indirect correlation and direct correspondence with the missionary mm -hmm. uh, and that can go from they are not on the website at all to we have mm -hmm. just a profile page of there with just first names uh, and then uh, we have some of the letters on there but we don't allow the print function uh, or we have uh, the, the letters not on the website, but there's just a simple post that every time a letter comes in, uh, you can actually request a letter from us uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, just adjust that uh, mm -hmm. per missionary basis on a, on a and, and the, the, the situations vary very greatly. Uh, now, now, in principle, it's, if, if you send a letter via email, uh, it's out there on the web just as much as on a secure website. Right. Uh, it's not, uh, it, you'll notice that if you go to this website, uh, unless you have a, a, a secure account, you won't be able to get any. Mm -hmm. Good. If that so, answers the question. Yeah, so there are different le differing levels of uh, participation and some to get a letter, you, you just get notified that a letter is available and it doesn't actually right. get posted uh, right. there on that website. And, and just to repeat what Marcus shared earlier, the whole thing, is is under password um under individual password protection so um so i think that's another level of security that uh, that might satisfy some of those that are that are needing uh, that extra level very good well thank you so much uh, for being here today uh, i have a question uh, yeah adrian yes um so as churches are developing you know their their missions emphasis what might be the right mix of supporting a few missionaries at larger amounts mm -hmm. so that you can have greater interaction with your missionaries versus supporting missionaries in all regions, all areas of the, the earth, at, but you're only capable of doing it financially at smaller amounts, and then your communication is stretched amongst more, uh, more missionaries. What might the panelists um suggest your talk to that issue good that's a great question very current a lot of, a lot of churches are going through this right now in a lot of different ways that's good anybody want to handle that yeah i i actually went through very recently and, and sort of did that just looked at all the missionaries we had and sort of made a survey uh, of how many churches do does each missionary have supporting mm -hmm. Uh, and, and sort of uh, uh, getting a feel where the support level is at. Uh, and, and you find the full spectrum, uh, even on the missionary side. Mm -hmm. You know, some missionaries, uh, it goes from, from 15 churches maybe to, to, to 50. Uh, and uh, I think the, the ideal is, is somewhere at the lower end of that number. Mm -hmm. This is simply because for the missionaries, it's just as hard. I think this is a two-way question. I think that that question goes just as much to the missionaries. Uh, you know, this what what can they maintain in communication? What they can they visit on furlough? Uh, and and then the other number that goes right into that is how many individual supporters they have, because many missionaries have have individual supporters too. Uh, and and uh, uh, there, there's an aspect there where um, we they need to be supported by a local church and not just individuals as well. Uh, so I, I think the, the 
there's certainly no magic numbers, uh, but but uh, uh, it's 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 a very good question to just carefully, prayerfully, prayerfully what what uh, applies in each situation. Good, good. Adrian, I, Andy, please. Just a, a couple of thoughts on that. I've interacted with a few people in the last year that their missions program varies greatly, and their even their approach um, to how they think about the number of missionaries or the geographical spread varies. And I think it's just an individual church um, deal to some extent, but there needs to be at least some care taken that the number of missionaries you're supporting is somewhat proportionate to the congregation size and the finances that you have available. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also helpful for missionaries to have a reasonably broad base of churches not too broad so that they're spending their deputation or their, their furlough time getting worn out instead of rested. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, not so small that um, what if one church uh, closes or bails on them, that half their support's gone. Right. Um, so it just seems like an issue of balance. And then there are some other factors that might come into play. I think probably a really unusual situation at Mount Calvary um, where Doug is, um, where Doug, maybe you can speak to this. How many missionaries from Mount Calvary were not sent out by Mount Calvary? As like, how many missionaries are? It's Mount Calvary's not the home church, right? Um, Mount Calvary is again unusual because we're located in Greenville, and whenever I talk on this topic, I always like to start by mentioning that we get the cream of the crop from the other good churches. But to answer Andy's question, um, I just counted them yesterday. We have 71 missionary units that we support. That would be families, individuals, or, or ministries. And there's only one of them that immediately came to my mind that wasn't one part at one time part of our church. So we sort of have a commitment. I wouldn't say sort of. We have a commitment to get behind our own people when they go to the field. So that's one of the reasons why we have a large number. But if I was starting out with a, with a ministry, I, I, I appreciate everything that's been shared so far, but I agree with the idea that you don't want so many that it's just a problem for the missionary. So if, if you're going to have a scale, I would like to see the scale more towards larger amounts. Good. Good. Anything else to add to that? I'll, I'll just throw in a, a practical. So, you know, our church has been larger in the past than it is today. And that's something that a, a church with longevity has to keep an eye on is changing financial reality. So if you support a missionary for 20 years, you know, the, the amount that you were giving them at the beginning of that 20 years doesn't have the same buying power at the end of that 20 years. And so we've had to keep a pretty close eye on this. And uh, the Lord has worked this out really to where the retirement of missionaries has allowed us um, to kind of keep, as, as Andy said, to keep a track of the size of our church and the financial capabilities of our church which has been a blessing. We haven't had to go to people and say, you know, we really need to trim down the number of missionaries we're supporting. And, you know, your name came to mind, uh, to, you know, to remove. It's, it's really just been as missionaries have retired, um, being very careful about not bringing on uh, a number of missionaries. So that's, you know, in longevity of ministry, that's something churches have to keep track of. We routinely um, call our missionaries mission boards and ask what the level of support is. And I, I would just commend that as a, as a best practice uh, once a year to call all your mission boards. I, John, we, we're checking up on you. You know, we'll call GFA. We have, I think, seven or eight of our missionaries are with GFA. And we'll call the office and say, hey, can you tell us what percentage of support uh, our missionaries are at? Sometimes you're surprised you know, by that. And, uh, and I know some of our missionaries are slow to, to say, Hey, I, you know, for whatever reason, my support's dropped. That's really helped us step in, in some circumstances and really help out where there was a need. Ben, I appreciate that. Cause that's something I have done somewhat for, with our church, but I'll tell you, it's a little awkward because sometimes the email or the 
you know, the phone call you realize goes straight back to the, the missionary. Right. So you question, should I just be asking each of my missionaries this or should I be asking the, the mission board or both mm -hmm. um, that question? Um, and, and so there's an awkwardness that maybe that would be a nice thing, GFA, to provide that type of report to your supporting churches that support your missionaries, mm -hmm. um, you know, on a, on a regular basis. Um, you know, a yearly basis to help churches understand that and understand um, that diminishing value. Thank you for pointing that out. That's something we um, sort of recognized recently uh, in a conversation internally that, you know, the amount that someone was brought on at, you know, in, you know, 1999 is not going to be as helpful as what we, we would want to bring them on at now. So, like you said, as people are retiring or you're making those decisions with the available funds. Um, and that's, that's a real challenge. We want to support new missionaries quickly getting to the field. And yet we also want to make sure that missionaries that we support are able to stay on the field. Um, and so I, I was curious what others said. Thank you for the comments. Um, uh, you know, there in South Carolina, I can fully understand uh, the situation there of, um, you know, the, the connection that you have with it sounds like 70 of the 71 units. Um, that, that's, that's wonderful. I wish we had more of that. And we have talked about uh, the conversations that were, were had earlier. How do we foster that our church is prepared to send out as uh, individuals, young or old, um, uh, become uh, eligible and, and prepared for the ministry? Yeah, good. That's good. Hey, if I could follow up uh, with a yeah. comment about GFA, um, the majority of our missionaries do serve under GFA. And I, I uh, have been in the habit of contacting GFA annually, and I get an excellent response from Dale Crawford with detailed information. So I just want to commend my friends at GFA for providing that to the local churches. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would, I would just, maybe I could just add one quick thing in the, uh, to this question. Um, I think churches um, maybe need to think of the financial support. Um, you know, a lot of times this question has to do with financial support. Uh, how many supporting churches for how much? I think it's helpful for churches to, to think of the financial support as part of the whole package. Um, that um, it's, it's really, really easy um, just to take on a lot of missionaries, but uh, a church ought to be thinking, how can we care for the missionaries? Not just the financial side, but we want to make sure that we don't take on more missionaries than we can adequately care for uh, and, and truly consider an extension of our ministry in another part of the world um, and let the financial part be a part of that, uh, that broader context. I think would also uh, help inform an answer to that question for an individual church. Uh, how many for how much? So, good. Thank you, Adrian. All right. Very good. Well, thank you all for being here. Thanks for sticking around and for the good Q&A time as well. A good interaction. Uh, we're thankful to the Lord for a good time together today. And I trust we'll see you on November 13th, Lord willing. Um, and do be, be sure to share this opportunity with others that might benefit from it as well. So God bless you. Thank you. Have a good day.